so hi everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Transfer Club seminar. Today we have Fei Yang with us. He's a doctoral student, a PhD student with Roshi Ya in, in, at Virginia Tech, where he, for the past few years, has been working on data centric machine learning, like uh, data acquisition, data selection, these kinds of problems. Fei Yang has a number of papers in the, in the area, in particular one which is of particular interest to us, Lava, but maybe he will be talking about a few more. Lava was presented at ICLIA last year. You have more submissions for this year. Let's see what we'll talk is about. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Thanks so much, Miguel, for the introduction. It's such a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to present here. And yeah, good afternoon to everyone in Europe. So my presentation today will have two parts. The first part is about our iClear paper last year, the LAVA paper on learning agnostic data evaluation. And if having enough time, I also prepared a second part for this presentation, which is presented both as an application of the LAVA paper as an extension and also connects to our iClear paper of this year, which we are going to present it next week at the iClear conference in Vienna. Yeah, the general topic of my research is about data intelligence in machine learning. I believe that's also the interest of Transfer Lab of everyone here. So this is a general research generally of our lab as, as well myself. Our lab is named Responsible Data Science Lab. And uh, we have primarily three research directions, data-centric AI, which includes data evaluation, data influence, data attribution, data selection, all the problems that we are interested in here. And also we're working on some trustworthy machine learning applications such as adversarial machine learning. Uh, nowadays, it's very the topic of AI safety with large language models are pretty popular. Uh, that problems also have a heavy part of data problem, so it is also our interest. Another one is about uh, privacy protection. I primarily working in the field of data-centric AI, and I also collaborate on applications in the other two fields. So this is a general a framework for uh, model-centric AI and data-centric AI. So in model-centric AI, we consider data as some standard part, uh, such as, for example, for vision models, we consider we use common benchmarks, such as ImageNet, CIFAR-10, or other common benchmarks, and we try to improve model architecture, improve through training to improve the final performance. And the data-centric AI is a counterpart of the previous view where we consider model as some standard part. For example, for vision applications, it will be like ResNet models. We consider it as a standard part and we try to improve data and improve data quality to improve the model performance. So these two point of view are more complementary to each other. They usually taking the order to improve. So this is a uh, a figure to depict like uh, the potential for data-centric AI. So when we scale up the application, this is how the model performance will change when we, on a small example, how the model performance will change. Uh, if we simply scaling up the model, model training without changing its data contribution or changing anything, we will see its performance will increases, but it may increase pretty slowly as a scaling law suggests, like the marginal reward for adding more data will observe a phenomena of diminishing return, which means the performance will likely to have a linear increase every time we double the data. And uh, we can see the green curve here. So if we instead, not just simply scaling up, instead we look into the data and clean the data and this is a simple case of just denoising the data. We can get much more visible performance improvements, and which is uh, favorable in terms of both training efficiency and computational efficiency. Andrew Ying defines this data-centric problem as a discipline of systematically engineering the data used to build an AI system. So the question we, we ask here is that how can we quantify data quality, like if we're talking about selecting good data, selecting better data, engineering the data, 
to for the machine learning application. How do we measure this relative quality of the data? How can we detect problematic data effectively and also efficiently at a large scale? And this comes to the first part of our presentation today about our one of our data evaluation method. So this is a, a general framework for data evaluation. So we first have a bunch of training data and we train a machine learning algorithm on this data and we measure its performance on some validation data. So the data evaluation problems ask this question, how can we do a backward attribution problem? How can we attribute the performance we achieve on this validation data back to its training data to understand how each of the training data point is contributing, whether it's the contribution is positive or negative and by how much. And for this data evaluation scheme, it has a number of applications. For example, it can help with interpretability, understand how our model is performing in terms of data, which training data point is contributing to this performance and which are not. And it can also help us a decision in data acquisition, like if we want to select more, select data to train a model, if, or if we want to collect more data to train a model, it can guide our decision of what data to collect. Similarly, it can also, if we are going to buy data or pay the people to overcome their privacy concerns, it can also help us to design this incentive scheme and also has like certain privacy applications to understand which training points are more memorized during this training process. And this is a very baseline idea of implementing data evaluation is this leave one out. It measures a counterfactual performance difference. For example, if we first train a model on, on three images on the left, and then we train another model without one of the images, and we calculate the performance difference by this two model training, and we use this difference as a counterfactual measure for the what if question, like what if we don't have this image, how much will we lose? So this is a very standard idea for defining data value. But the problem is that when there's many training data, the influence of taking out one example and retraining the model, the difference can be very small. And for machine learning models, there's inherent stochasticity in model training, so which this often makes this signal indistinguishable with noise. For example, here, this is a very practical case that we may see a baseline accuracy of 81% after we're taking out one example and the performance comes to 80% and we'll get a measure for the influence of this data as only 1%. And there are also other issues with this uh, leave wild measurement. For example, if there are duplicated samples, like samples that, that are exactly the same, from the idea of data evaluation, since these samples are all the same, they should all receive the same data value. But if we marry it in this way, like leave one out, if there are duplicate samples and each time we only remove one of them, since there are still exactly same identical samples remaining in the training set, it is very possible the performance is not changed. So we will get a, a zero score for the value of this data. But in fact, it should not be zero. So there are many issues with this simplest idea. And one way that people have improved over this leave one out idea is like leave one out each time we're only taking out one sample and the measures is a marginal contribution to the whole training set. And when the whole training set is very large, it, it gets lots of issues. So one solution is instead of calculating its marginal contribution to the whole training set, we calculate its marginal contribution to every subset in this training data set, to every combination, possible combination, and taking the average of all of these marginal contributions as is data value, so which leads to the idea of Shapley value, as well as several other semi values, depends on how you average this marginal contributions. So this in general gives a much better score that is more robust, more useful, more helpful to most of the purpose we care about in data evaluation. 
But the problem is, every time we want to measure this marginal contribution, we need to train two models. We need to train a model with this sample and without this sample. And if you want to calculate this marginal contribution with respect to all combinations, this requires an exponential number of model training. So for modern machine learning applications, even repeating this training process for a few times can be quite expensive. And if we tell people that you need to repeat this for an exponential number of times, it's hard to think that anyone out of academia would be interested. So this is the problem. This is the landscape we are looking at. So the baseline method is this leave one out, which is most intuitive and easiest to explain to people like why this is reasonable, but it just impractical is far less capable than it appears. And the other one is this Shapley value. It produces more useful value at the expense of being extremely inefficient. So that's a problem of this efficiency and utility trade-off. So the issues for leave one out and all this Shapley-like method is it requires model retraining. During this pipeline, this model training is a costly process. It needed to be repeated by many times and even up to exponential times. It is only affordable when there's on like a very few data sources to be evaluated. Like if you are not interested in evaluating data point and instead you are evaluating say data sources where there are like 10, 20 data sources, maybe that exponential number can be acceptable with some estimation approximation method, but if you want to do data point level valuation, this is not a practical idea. And yeah, it's almost useless for this purpose. There are some applications, I think you may have already know some of it, like this KN Shapley, which use the KN model to approximate the model training process. So we are training a neural network model so instead, we are not doing a neural network. We are just using a KNN model as a proxy, and it produces something like much faster. And today, we are introducing this like learning agnostic data evaluation scheme, which achieves near linear time and much better utility compared to KN Shapley method. So as we talked about, this model training part is expensive and uh, problematic part. So the focus is on how to replace this learning algorithm. How do we find a viable proxy? So this is a model training pipeline, like this learning algorithm here is our target machine learning model. If it is a, it is a ResNet model, it is whatever our target machine learning model is. This KN Shapley method is, okay, we just disregard whatever your target machine learning application is. We just put a KN model here. We just do a data evaluation with respect to a KN model, and we hope it applies to all machine learning applications. So way KN works has some theoretical properties that it approximates like general machine applications in a certain way, so that it works to, by replacing the machine learning application with a, G a KN approximator, uh, it still works. Even though it disregards your target application, the value we receive from that approximation still applies to many general machine learning applications. So KN, not only because it's a simple machine learning model to approximate it, but KN has an explicit solution. Like the sol solution for every KN problem, you can directly write it out in a straightforward equation. So that even if we want to evaluate this KN for an exponential number of trainings, because the solution to each of the problem, we can directly write it down as equations. Even if we have many of them, we can directly take in the average of these equations and instead only solving a single problem, instead of needing to evaluate it for an exponential number of times and averaging the results. So that's the advantage of it, why it can achieve a near linear time complexity for an exponential problem. Right, so this is a KN Shapley is one solution to replacing this learning algorithm. Its idea is to use a, a simplest, almost simplest possible learning algorithm, which has an explicit solution. 
to replace this training algorithm, which can support like a data evaluation scheme. So our idea is we go further. Okay, we are trying to get rid of that proxy model altogether. Can we like since we are training a machine learning model on the training data and then test it on the validation data and use a score on the validation data to evaluate the training data. So can we go further, like just getting rid of this proxy altogether and by directly measuring the relationship between training and validation data to do this data evaluation? So one possible idea is our starting point is the data set distance between this training data and the validation data. So the general idea is the smaller the data set distance, the higher performance, and the bigger data set distance, um, the lower performance will be. And this is one of our pilot experiments in this work, a motivating example. We train several like commonly used machine learning models like ResNet models and with CIFAR-10 and on this commonly used vision benchmarks. And we found that this correlation holds very nicely, like between training data and validation data. The larger the data set distance, the worse the performance. And from this figure, you can see that not only is this a correlation, this is an almost linear relationship between model performance and data set distance. And this linear correlation, if it is true, like if it is really linear, this has some very nice properties, which means if you are able to fit this curve, you can easily predict the model performance solely from this data set distance. This is our motivation. So we tried using the optimal transport distance as a distributional distance. There are many distributional distance out there. So imagine that we have two set of data points. These are the training data set and these are the validation data set. So consider this as items at certain warehouse. So this is uh, some original nodes and these are some destination nodes. So imagine these are some items at certain warehouse. So there are different amount of items at different warehouse and we want to move them from each of the original node to the destination node. And the optimal transport distance is a minimum transport cost for us to move these items from the original nodes to the destination nodes. So how does this matter and why we choose this optimal transport distance and not the others? So first, like let's look at this transportation problem here. Many plants can do this transportation. Like we can either move this items from here to here, or we can move it from here to here. So there are different ways to do this transportation. What it means for this distributional distance problem is that this items as the original nodes, this is actually the probability mass, the distribution for the data of a training data set. And this is, a, for example, the distribution of its validation data set. So Assume this is a distribution for the training data and assume this is a distribution for the validation data. And we are trying to measure the distributional distance between these two distributions. And what does it mean for this distributional distance? We can imagine these two distributions as a pile of dirt and its distance is we want to reshape the first pile of dirt to the shape of the second pile of dirt. If we want to do so, what is the amount of labor to do it? So this is equivalent to the problem of moving goods from between warehouse. These two problems are the same. So from this warehouse transportation problem, we can see there are many different transport plans to do the same. Like you can either move the item to its closest point or you can move it to its farthest point. And this different way of doing transportation will give us different matters for this distance. So why we have this problem? This in fact is on dimension more than two. The definition for distance between two set of points is not unique. So if we have a set of points here, we have a set of points there, what are the difference? What are the discrepancy between these two set of points? This definition is not unique. There's arbitrarily many ways of defining this distance. 
So optimal transfer distance is as among all this possible distance, we define the minimum possible distance as a metric between these two set of points or two probability distributions or two or warehouses of items, whatever. So optimal transport is just defining the minimum of all possible distances. It has some nice mathematical property as you can see from its definition as for a distributional distance metric is it's more restricting. And there are simpler like other distance metric, for example, maximum mean discrepancy, MMD, it is in fact just mean discrepancy. What it does, it just, you take the average of all your points at one set, and you take the average of all your data points at the other set, and you just calculate the distance between these two averages. And that's an alternative for defining this distributional distance. And you can see that the second way, you lose much of the information because you take average first, and no matter what is your original data, it first collapses to a flat problem, and you're only taking the average between this simplified problem. Much of the information is lost in this process. We can see from a very simple example, like in this optimal transport problem, if we use this minimum distance, whenever this distribution changes, even if it's a minimal changes, for example, it becomes this, like with only a small change in the distribution, we will see a difference in the optimal transport distance. But if it is a mean discrepancy, it is very possible that if you make some changes to the distribution, but its average does not change, you will get like a no change in the like mean distribution. And we'll explain later like why this property is very important. The general property for this optimal transport distance is it will respond to any changes in, in the distribution. So why optimal transport? As we explained, it is a well-defined distance metric. It is unique and always unique and well-defined. It is computationally tractable and is computable from finite examples. So as by definition, this optimal transport is a linear programming problem. Like we have uh, two distributions and we are just solving a simple minimization by moving like data points from one distribution to another distribution. So by definition, this is a linear programming problem. And if we want to solve a linear programming as a linear program, its complexity is pretty high. It's probably at the level of cubic complexity if we want to solve it as this. There's some knowledge, there's some very efficient approximations to this optimal transport problems by adding some regularizer to the linear programming. So for this optimal transport distance between this data set, not only does it have this empirical correlation between model performance, actually this is also supported by theoretical results. Uh, this is a theorem known as KR duality, Kantonovich rubinstein duality. It states that for any model, any machine learning model under general assumptions, its validation loss on this validation data set is upper bounded by its training loss on its training data sets plus optimal transport distance. So this is a theoretical results available for this optimal transport distance. The first is applies to all training loss. So assumption here is a Lipschitz constant for the model parameter. So this is the upper bound. How tight is the upper bound depends on the Lipschitz smoothness of the machine learning model. And in practice, for the same machine learning application, if we keep the training recipe the same and only change its training data, in general, its effective Lipschitz constant is stable. Like it does not change a lot. So which means the correlation between this validation loss with this validation loss on the left-hand side and the other part on the right-hand side, this correlation is relatively stable as we see in this empirical results in this figure. So even though this is the upper bound, that if the Lipschitz a constant of the model changes a lot, if this behavior of the model is super unpredictable and this upper bound will be loose but in practice, more cases we see that the correlation between the left-hand side and the right-hand side is rather 
stable, which is almost an equivalent rather than an upper bound. So in practice, if we train the model with empirical loss minimization for a more for a capable machine learning model nowadays, its training loss can usually be reduced to almost zero. So this optimal transport distance can provide a direct indication of the validation loss. So this is a theoretical result, which is also corresponding to the empirical results we see here. This explains why there is that a linear correlation between model performance and uh, distribution of distance. So if this is true, every time we want to do data evaluation, we do not need to retrain this machine learning model. We can only measure this optimal transport distance and directly use this as a substitute for the model performance. Based on this idea, if we want to use optimal transport distance instead of in substitute of the machine learning model and do this data evaluation, Every time we want to do this data point evaluation, we still need to repeat the process, like calculate the optimal transport distance with one data point and calculate it without one data point. As we mentioned, this optimal transport is a linear program. And if solving this linear program is expensive at a very large scale, this still has efficiency problem. Like we need to keep calculating, computing this optimal transport distance. But even for that, we already have a great advantage when we have machine learning model in the loop, one of the major problem is not from the small signal by removing one sample training samples at each time, but more from the learning stochasticity from training the machine learning model. So it's a problem about signal to noise ratio. Is this plot here? Uh, we replace the training machine learning model with calculating the optimal transport distance, which get rid of the stochasticity in this process. So even if it is the same complexity, the signal to noise ratio is much larger than before, which means you need much fewer numbers of repetition to get a clear signal for data values. But we don't stop here. The idea previously is that the data value is defined as a contribution to the model performance, and now we replace it to the contribution to the set distance. And so previously, calculate the data value as this marginal contribution to the model performance measured by repeating the training with and without a data point, now it becomes a sensitivity to this data set distance. And then how to measure it? A naive idea is we just calculate this, compute this optimal transport data set distance twice for each training data to measure its difference. But since this is defined as an optimization problem here, we can directly calculate this gradient with respect to this optimal transport distance instead of needing to repeat this computation every time. The general idea is that we just directly take the gradient. Since this is a linear programming problem, we are calculating the gradient of the optimal transport distance to the probability mass of each data point to get a matter of how important each data point is. Like if we have a little bit more or a little bit less of a data point, how will the optimal transport distance changes, whether it will become larger or smaller. So our data value is defined by uh, this equation and the optimal transport, the gradient of the optimal transport distance with respect to its probability mass. And since this is defined as a linear program, the solution, the result of this gradient, we do not need to actually calculate the differentiation of the optimal transport distance because this gradient is exactly the due solution of this linear programming problem. So which means when we're solving this linear programming problem for OT, if we do not solve the primal problem, if we directly solve the due problem, the due solution is exactly, is already the gradient we are looking for. This gradient is available for free. We only solve a single optimization problem and we get the gradient with respect to the probability mass of all training data points all at once for free. So we only need to compute a single optimal transport distance and we are done. And in practice, because not just in this problem, like in most practical applications, because the primal problem of the optimization problem is constrained maybe a very sparse matrix or have other numerical issues. So most of the time when people solving a linear programming, we directly solve for the due instead of the primal. 
So which is also the case here. So every OT solvers out there are directly solving the due problem and producing the due solution. So we don't even need to make any modification to the OT solver. Just find any OT solver out there and solve the OT problem here, and it will give you the due solutions, which is the gradient information we look for here. Then due to some property, like we are perturbing this probability distribution, and the probability distribution to be well-defined, the probability mass of all data points must add up to one. And if we just the probability mass of a single data point, it will no longer sum up to one. So we need to project it back to the probability simplex of which equals to one, so which we need to add a, do a simple calibration, which means we need to, the actual gradient of a data point is its gradient of itself minus the average gradient of all other data points. So to ensure your project back to the probability simplex. So we are done to calculating this data value. The optimal transport is formulation is minimizing the transport cost subject to the constraint of the probability distribution in this transport plan add up to one for all the original data and all the validation for all the training data and all the validation data. So the variable here in this optimal transport problem is a transport plan, like transport from every transport the probability mass from every training point to every validation point. We want to minimize the total transport distance and subject to the constraint that this transport plan will make sure that you transport all the probability mass from the training data set to the validation data set, no more, no less. So this is a simple, simple <laughs> linear programming, linear programming problem. And we can see that in this primal problem on these constraints, we have the probability mass on, on the right-hand side of this, all these constraints. So which means when we do the primal due transformation, this coefficients will directly become the coefficients of the due problem. When we're taking the gradient with respect to these parameters in the due problem, we directly get the due solution as a gradient. So here's a number of applications. It can be used for like noisy label detection, a noise feature noise detection, a data set redundancy, balancing un unbalanced data set, <laughs> some interesting applications de detecting irrelevant data, so which just has no contribution to anything. <laughs> so this is a procedure, operational procedure of using this lava to do data evaluation. We first solve the optimal transport problem and calculate the gradient with respect to each of the samples as our lava score, and we assign lava score to each of the training individual data points, and we rank all the data points based on the score. You can interpret this score as a quality matter for the data, how it's contributing. Whether adding more of this data or similar data will reduce the data set distance or push it further. If we will make the data set distance smaller, which means this is a data we need, that will bring the training data set closer to the validation data set. We, we want more data like this. If having more of this data will make the distance between training and the validation larger, which means this data is not good enough, it is probably an outlier. The more we have of data like this, the further the data set distance will become. Uh, the machine learning application may perform worse on this validation data. So that's the interpretation of why this gradient relates to the data quality. We rank the data, and then we inspect the data points according to the ranking. If you want to select the best quality ones, you just keep the highest scoring ones. And if you want to remove like outliers, mislabeled or noisy features, you just take out those lowest ranking ones. It is likely to have a negative score here which means having more of this data will increase optimal transport distance, which means will harm your machine learning application performance, So, which is rather straightforward. And we define this notion of detection rate. For example, if you want to detect bad data points, we just inspect from the lowest scored samples and define this detection rate as the number of samples we inspected, uh, number of true 
bad samples, among all bad samples we injected into this problem. We will visualize this landscape like it will be like this. So for example, this is detecting noisy labels, and this is based on data value ranking. And you can see that the more data we inspect from the lowest score, the more bad data we will be able to detect. I will say probably at this point, probably this is a good like operational point where we discard one fourth of the data. And among that, we have already filtered out like 90% of all the bad data. But in each application, you can decide like where is your ideal operational point. It's this operational point of, sorry, of having like throwing, for example, set the threshold here, like throwing one fourth of the data equivalent to the point here, which means you can train the same model with just three quarters of the original data and achieves even better performance. So this is how the result is about noisy feature detection. It's similar as the previous one is mislabeled data. You can imagine this as images with very poor quality. It performs similarly. We have this one result here about data set reduction. So this data evaluation method is designed for identifying like data points with better or worse quality. It is not directly designed for the data selection problem. So I want to like make it clear that it is actually a tricky problem when using data evaluation for data selection. This is a, an active research area. People are still trying to make connections here. So we in here implement a small experiment about this uh, data set reduction. Like if we throw in data based on this data value scores, like throwing the lowest scoring data, how will we retain the performance? This is the result, like our method is able to like maintain performance somewhat better than the other baselines. Oh, we have the random baseline here, you can see, and uh, performs better than the random baselines. So the idea is that we, we are able to so first throw out those like bad quality data, like mislabeled or with noisy features, such that we are able to retain the performance for a longer period compared to other baselines. But the idea is that this is not designed for data selection. This can only be applied in limited applications like that. This is not intended to be a general data selection method or data pruning method. But probably it's helpful for pruning, but it is not for selecting core set. Like you can throw away like a lowest score samples, but if you do the opposite, if you select only the highest score samples, probably the result is not that good. You don't get a core set. You may just get a weird data set. It is a tricky issue that many data evaluation works tries to add some experiments for data selection because there's otherwise there are not many applications that it can be applied to, but the results are often tricky. Like you can beat other data evaluation method, but often you don't want to compare with orthogonal data selection method. So which to my personal opinion is that that's not a, I will personally not use data evaluation method for data selection directly. There are certain assumptions need to be met before you can do so, I will explain. There's also an interesting application of balancing unbalanced data set. Like if the data set is unbalanced, the performance is affected by that, by throwing out unbalanced, because we are trying to minimize the distributional distance. So it naturally has this idea of a balancing, of matching distributions by design. So when throwing low quality data, it will first throw out those data that contributed the most to increasing the optimal transport distance, which means throwing data based on this method can decrease the data set distance at the quickest rate. So it is most effective compared to other methods in terms of balancing and balanced data set. Most advantage for this method is the runtime. To our best knowledge, it's magnitude faster than any data evaluation methods out there. We only need to solve a single optimal transport distance, as we explained. We do not even need to solve it as a linear programming. Nowadays, the state of art implementation can solve its regularized version as a convex optimization, that's a sync core algorithm. It's a convex optimization, so it has exponential convergence rate. It converges very, very fast. And also, 
now it has a GPU implementation. So this is a large scale like optimization problem where the metrics are all the constraints with the data points, the very large metrics. Now we are able to handle that computation on GPUs. So which is probably two orders faster than doing the same thing on CPU, like 100 times faster. So as a result, we are able to solve million level data evaluation problems in a single optimal transport problem, which can be solved in as few as like three to five minutes. We can do like a million level data evaluation. And to our best knowledge, that is much faster than any other algorithms out there. And we also have an advantageous utility for this method. Among this methods, this key shop play is developed by our team. So we have like it's an original implementation. And for other methods, we actually have a, an implementation for all of this method because we are we'll be working on data evaluation works for several projects. So we need to keep implementing this baseline in every work. So we have implementations for all of them. And also this runtime scores as reported here is comparable to the complexity as reported in their original paper. This optimal transport problem as we reported here has a linear complexity. This is unparalleled compared to all other methods out there. And this is uh, probably the only one that can leverage this GPU computation. So not only it has a linear complexity, the GPU implementation is also 100 times faster than CPU implementation. You pass all this factor together, the result is that this is much, much faster than any other method. I think the closest one to our method, why is this Ken Shapley? The other one is the data OOB that, really, that was published last year at CML, I remember. I saw Transfer Lab also has that implementation on GitHub. They are also applicable. They claim to be applicable to a million scale problems, as I heard from them. But that algorithm only runs on CPUs, to my knowledge. So I guess it's still not as fast as this one. This is a bonus slide. Like I'll just very quickly introduce the idea here. Is that as an extended discussion, data value between the relationship between data evaluation and data selection, and a problem that many people were asking about: Can data evaluation method be applied to data selection? So data evaluation generates a, a scalar value to rank the data points. Well, data selection is a combinatorial problem by nature. So that's why finding core sets for in data selection problem is so computationally expensive. In this data selection problem, every time you select a data point, the marginal value for other data points and their ranking will change, and it will change like a lot. So here's an extreme case. Identical data points will all receive the same data value based on this fairness constraints, but you typically don't want to select duplicated data points in data selection. This is one fundamental difference. So in data selection problem, once you pick a data point, all the identical data points or similar data points will quickly lose this value because you don't want having duplicated of them. So this is a fundamental difference here. So if we want to use data valuation method, which has a flat structure, just a scalar value to this data selection problem, which is computational by nature, the key assumption is here. When does this ranking for marginal value of data does not change or does not change much? One example here, one possible case is here, is that when the update to the model is incremental. So what does this mean? So when you are fine-tuning a model or doing a continual pre-training of a pre-trained model, the update to the model can be perceived as incremental. Like even as you add data, the effective data distribution of the model does not change that much. Like so that the relative marginal contribution for adding new data points does not change that much. In that case, the solution you get from this data evaluation works will be equivalent to this result from a data selection problem that tries to solve the combinatorial problem. That is actually the other work I guess we won't have time to discuss today. So the idea is that if we want to use data evaluation method for data selection, we want to find the case where this marginal contribution of the data value, data value does not change very much. So first of all, this influence function, its idea is using a second order approximation to the original model, right? It calculates the Hessian. 
it approaches an original model as the second order approximation as the hedge matrix. You can also uh, imagine that as a proxy model, and tracing is further simplified. It. Influence function is a second order approximation using Hessian. Tracing is just a first order approximation using the gradient. Its original idea is to track through the training process where we calculate the gradient at multiple checkpoints and aggregate the result. But in practice, usually just using the final checkpoint is good enough, or there will be a single checkpoint where the result we get from this checkpoint is better than all the others and better than averaging over the others. And also for computational efficiency, we may only use it for a single checkpoint. So we can simplify the idea of tracing as just a first order approximation, a calculate the gradient. And there's a one major efficiency problem for tracing that we need to point out here. We are calculating the gradient. We need to calculate the gradient with respect to each sample. So which means we usually calculate this gradient in the same way as we train machine learning models. We just do a backward propagation to get the gradients. But if we want to get the gradient with respect to the each samples, we have to use a batch size of one to ensure that this backward propagation gives us a gradient with respect to a single sample. So this greatly limits its efficiency. Its complexity is almost as a training this model with a batch size of one. So we actually make this one step further on this data attribution and influence attribution problem at scale. That the influence function is a second order approximation, tracing is a first order approximation. So we go one step further in this direction. We propose the idea of doing a zeroth order approximation. What does it mean? We just simply unlearn a model. Like we apply like gradient descent or gradient ascent on, on the samples and actually train the model, update the model and use the update model to redo the inference of the training data and measure how the performance of the model changes after this updating the model so as a, to get a zero order approximation for this uh, data influence and attribution problem. Once again, like it's a magnitude faster than tracing. <laughs> Well, I think this uh, comes to the idea of tracing that it proposed to track through the checkpoints, through the training process and aggregating over the checkpoints to get rid of the issue you mentioned. That because the relative contribution of the data during different stages of the training can be different. But in practice, what people found is that usually using one checkpoint is good enough. It, it may be the final checkpoint. It may be some checkpoint closer to the final, but usually the influence result we estimate from a single checkpoint is better than using the aggregated influence from multiple checkpoints. And also it's more computational efficient. I think that kind of answers your question from an empirical point of view. So theoretically, it should have a difference, but in practice, it does not seem to make much of a difference. This is it. I think this is the uh, time we have for this presentation. Yeah. And so, Thank you. See you. Thank I wrote, you. I wrote. Thank you.